Runners only with Dom Harvey. Runners only with Dom Harvey and from Christchurch, Zach Guilford. G'day, mate. Hey, brother. How are you? Really, really good. It's so good to connect with you again. Uh, Monday, the 19th of December, and uh, just basically a, a couple of days off home detention for you. Friday, December 16th. That was the last day. You're a free man now. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I was all, I was really looking looking forward to it. Like the last two weeks was pretty hard because they put me on sort of full lockdown, so I couldn't who, um, leave who, the house. Who, who did like corrections? Yeah, corrections. I was late home from a from a, a cricket game, forty five minutes late. So they sort of, I think it was a a test from uh, their point of view, and it was a test because um, you know I started to get a good bit of balance in my life, and then uh, yeah, the last two weeks were really challenging. I wasn't allowed out um, at all, really, but. Um, I guess that's part of the punishment, so I accepted that, just, and um, yeah, managed to get through the sentence. But not a lot has changed, really. You, you, um, you seem you seem a little bit frustrated by that. Were they being were they being a little bit petty, maybe? Uh yeah, they're, they're hopeless. Um, didn't really get a lot of support from the system, to be honest. Um, you know, even though it's you know obviously my fault, I was there doing the the punishment. I would. I would say, but it would have been nice if there was a bit more of sort of a rehabilitative focus on um, on the sentence as well, instead of just uh, locking you up for nine months and throwing away the key. But um, as I said, there were heaps of learnings from that rock bottom experience still on the way up, but um, mm. extremely grateful for it, but would have liked a little bit more support. Yeah, yeah. Cause you, you and I have been in touch on a regular basis this year, and I know, I know you've done a lot of work, but um, it's all come from within really, hasn't it? Pretty much, yeah. Like I sort of, as we talked about the last podcast, made a decision. You know, I wasn't, well, I did try and, um, I guess, commit suicide last year. And I realized, you know, once I made that choice and I come around again, that I didn't want to die. So the, the options were to sort of either hide under a rock for the rest of my life or use the tools I'd learned over time and um, sort of try and put to bed a few addictions I'd struggled with over time. And um, yeah, it was a fucking hard nine months to tell you the truth, but um, glad I'm at the end of it now, and glad that I've got a bit more freedom. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to ask you about that because um, yeah, a lot of people, especially if you listen to I don't know, like News Talk ZB, a lot of people when they talk about home detention, this is people that haven't been on it. They talk about how it's basically just a, like a cushy, a cushy punishment. You know, you're sitting at home, you're watching Netflix. Um, why was it tough? What's tough about it? Um, I guess when I first started the punishment, I was in employment, or well, the sentence, I should say. Um, and I was I was getting uh, quite a lot of help from corrections, and then I uh, sort of walked out on that employment. Things didn't really align, so um, it was sort of back to square one. Not square one for me, but um, a point where you know I was spending a lot of time at home and trying to build my own things up from the bottom. Um, so it was a lengthy process and a test of patience and I don't have a lot of patience at the best of times. So I'm pretty proud of myself for actually sitting in that struggle and getting through it and not losing the plot and ending up with, um, you know, a breach or a harsher sentence. But yeah, I guess things like, you know, not being able to see a psychologist through the probation system because I wasn't deemed, um, what's the word at risk enough or dangerous enough. Um, and I think just scraping through with, I guess, you know, a few bare minimum programs they sort of chucked me on and um, not being allowed to, I guess, enjoy a lot of freedom at all, um, which I was enjoying at the start of the sentence. And it, they sort of closed shop after that. So it was sort of sit home and build a few things up in the background and get on with it the best I can. But we're there now. So, yeah. yeah. It, does, it does seem a bit strange that because you think it'd be um, like, like um, your yeah, maximum restrictions in the early stages and then more freedom as the sentence progresses. But it was the opposite for you. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. So, like, I was out, you know, within the first month or two, getting a lot of balance into my life. I was allowed to go to the gym. I was allowed to get out and play golf. And then, as I said, they sort of shut up shop a little bit. So, um, nice dog, Dom. Those were some of my. Um, <laughs> those are some of my harshest learnings because um i'm not one that's that patient um so that's been a big learning and i'm not one that um likes to be told what to do so i sort of had to drop a lot of the ego there 
and realized that uh, I wasn't in power here, so I need to shut up and get, you know, do my best to get on with it and listen to the instructions that are being put in front of me. Yeah, so so the bracelet, um, the home detention bracelet came off on um, Friday afternoon. Um, how, how does it feel after that? Is it, is it strange? Is it scary? Is it liberating? Like, what do you, what do, you do? Yeah, it was weird. So I um, got the bracelet taken off and then we went, um, a few of us, a few of the boys that are working for me and a few close mates went over to the beach and had a bit of a swim and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, the boys were going on about their usual Friday night and I sort of come home with one other close mate and um, we went and got a feed. But I don't know, there was a bit of anxiety floating around. I didn't um, I didn't want to go into the mall or go to any big places. So we sort of come home, had a feed on the Friday night and then I was in bed by nine. <laughs> <laughs> well, for what it's worth, mate, in the middle of December, not many people do want to go to the mall. It's a terrifying place. <laughs> yeah, and what was I the, was freaking out. What do you think, this might be a, a tough question to just answer simply, but um, what were the biggest learnings about yourself on home detention? Um, definitely one of patience. Um, when I spoke to you last time, you know, I was fresh into my, I guess, recovery journey. Um, so I was sort of riding that pink cloud, but then when a few challenges got put in front of me, you know, like the, you know, the employment thing and having to rebuild again in terms of finding new employment and stuff. Um, that was when the real tests began. Um, so, you know, I started playing a few stories through my own head, you know, is this, is this really worth it? I'm not where I want to be now, but, um, yeah, I guess having sat in that struggle for once, instead of trying to find, um, ulterior ways to get out of it, like addiction, there were a lot of learnings there for me. Um, yeah. a lot, you know, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd never sit in, sit in, um, sit in the struggle, and especially for the, you know the few months I had to there. So uh, that was the biggest one for me is just sitting in discomfort and, and learning from it. Because yeah, so you, you're um, your sobriety. So you, you've been off um, you've drugs, alcohol, gambling. Your three biggest vices since March this year was that um, was that a court imposed thing, or was that just something you decided you had to do? Um, well, it was definitely court imposed as well, but. I guess, like I said, um, said to you previously, I wanted to start rebuilding my life in an yeah. authentic way. I didn't want to be the guy that had these identities attached to me and couldn't break them, if you know what I mean. So I made that decision to give it a real crack. So as long as, along with being court imposed, it was sort of something that it was definitely something that come within as well. And I've got a few good mates down here that um, you know on similar journeys, so it helps me stay accountable. Yeah, I suppose that's the key thing, eh? Like having that support network around you, people that are on the same, you know, like-minded people, people on the same page. Um, but I, I've got friends who have, um, you know, quit booze, uh, and they they say to me, they all say a similar story. They say it can be quite confronting having to face all your demons and your flaws and your problems without masking it. Is that sort of what your experience has been? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, there's no um, putting that plaster on. I guess for me, you know, I went to cricket a few weeks ago and. Um, it was the first time I've been to cricket without having a beer, and that that seemed really foreign. But you know, the game I played on the weekend, um, I guess going that second time not having a beer becomes a lot more normal, if you know what I mean. But um, you know, gambling was a massive one for me when I had when I faced adversity or struggles. That was sort of my safe space was to you know go and just um, put the mask on and get away from everything, go into a world that um, where you feel safe and you can't be disturbed. But that was my false sense of safety so i'm slowly growing further apart from that identity which is nice yeah and are you enjoying the sober life uh yeah it's good i mean don't get me wrong there uh i guess you know when i could hear 660 playing from home on my last <laughs> week of uh home d that was quite triggering i was like fuck this this sucks you know everyone else having a good time i'm sitting here <laughs> doing nothing but um oh, it's just you know just those mind games and it, you know once i fight through those urges or triggers, it, it, you really realize that um, addiction isn't worth it and that it's only, as I'd say, a temporary plaster. And then once you remove that plaster, the wounds come oozing out. So, um, yeah, that's... Yeah. And is it scary to think of a life without vices? Like you know, New Year's Eve come, is coming up. I'm guessing this is going to be the first New Year's Eve you've been sober for as long as what you can remember, really. Uh yeah, what about, yeah, yeah. What about like temptation, yeah, fully, temptations? Fully and, sober. Yeah. Yeah, fully sober. No, it'll be it'll be tough, but I think, you know, as I said, I've created a really sort of safe container down here. So people ask, what plans you made? What are you doing? And I said, oh, yeah, not much will change really. You know, a few more runs, a few more trainings down the open, a few more beaches, um, 
waterfalls but yeah not much will change for me really yeah oh that's cool and how's christmas going to look for you what who are you going to be with are you with your family or you're you're staying down there in christchurch um i haven't even made any plans like (laughs) yeah it's it's um probably just stay down here dom and then head up north and catch up with a few people and sort of late december and stuff but i'm just playing it day by day at the moment just getting through each day and um seeing what each day brings so yeah, as a yeah, not too many plans to be honest. Yeah, oh, that's good. And and you, you're um next year's looking busy for you. You're um you you've got a coaching job uh, with the Wood End Rugby Club. Um, is this something you can see, like in your? I mean, it'd be, it be should be the most amazing thing. Is, is if 15 years from now you become like the All Black coach or something? It'd be an, <laughs> <laughs> it'd be like I don't... an incredible story of redemption. Like, do you have coaching aspirations? Mm. I mean, you've got I've a lot. Of... You do have a lot to offer the sport. Yeah, I got approached by Wooden after I'd done the last podcast with you. Um, so they're other great people. So I sort of said, yeah, I'll coach and yeah, I'll play as well. So um, I've definitely committed to a lot heading into next year. But something that I'm excited about, it'll, um, it sort of pulls me out of my comfort zone and puts me into something that's going to test me. And that's where I find that I grow. Um, I don't have any aspirations to be the All Blacks coach. That looks hard enough as it is at the moment. But, um, oh, we'll see how we go, you know, if I can relate to the players well and that transfers through, through I don't know, leadership or my coaching skills, and that's cool. But I'm sort of stepping into a bit of the unknown as well, I guess. Yeah. Now, you know, what was the story with Wooden? There was a bit of backlash there when that was announced, right? I remember reading about this. And there were, there were what was the scandal with that? Yeah, so... Uh, they sort of have had a few years of, of struggling towards the bottom of the ladder. And I think what happened is they just said, oh, Zach's going to be coached, like it or leave it sort of thing. And then um, a, a few board members, I think, left. Um, but since then, you know, we've had um, we've started our pre-season. We've had um, a pretty honest AGM um, that was interesting to be part of. And the club's heading in the right direction. So if there are any players out there that, that want to... Uh, <laughs> that want to, I guess, spread their wings and come and play for us where we will do with uh, any help that we can get. Yeah, how, how does um, yeah, how, how does that make you feel, like the backlash with the board members and stuff? I mean, does it, um, do you, is there a part of you that can understand it or does it sort of, like, hurt your feelings? It's like, you, you, you know, it's like you, you, make a mis- you make a mistake or you make several mistakes and then you pay the price and you try and move on with your life. But there's always going to be, I feel like, that element of society that's going to try and, you, you know, refuse you the right to redemption. Yeah, I guess for me, it's like a bit of a mixture of emotions. You know, you get that hurt in a child that thinks, oh, it's not this fair. sucks, you know, yeah. I, I feel like shit. But then um, I have to put my hand up and take responsibility and realise that I was the one that that, have made, that had made a few mistakes, especially over the last 10 years and struggled to break that cycle. So I can definitely see where they're, they're coming from at the same time. So, yeah, like anything, it's a bit of a roller coaster of emotions. You're like, oh. These guys don't like me. Oh, I'm shit. Blah blah. But then, yeah, I guess once get out of that victim mentality and put put my hand up, it, you can, I can sort of make a bit more peace with it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I suppose um, yeah, the more daylight you can put between uh, your mistakes and where you are now as a person, like the less it'll get over time. But I suppose that's the thing. It's just time, right? Yeah, exactly. It's confidence, time, doing the right thing, um, surrounding myself with the right people. And it's a pretty simple plan, you know. It's not to go back to the stuff that that eventually ruined my life and you know nearly brought me to suicide so um it's a simple plan but it can be a tricky one as well in the mind of an addict yeah yeah mentally you know you're mostly a good place now i know the last couple of weeks and on home detention were rough for you but it's more good days than bad days um yeah more good days than bad days at the moment like don't get me wrong you know i still struggle get stuck in my own head um you know again just around the patience thing and not being where i want to be when um you know so used to living life of I guess just turning up to training and massive amounts of wages being put into <laughs> the account on a monthly basis, you know, to, I guess, break away from that identity as a rugby player and try and carve something new for myself and, you know, the business world community. And again, um, you know, out at what end, it's, um, it's challenging, but one that I know that's going to be worth it in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you you ended up in, um, in this position um, after you... Um, yeah, I stole some money from your granddad to, to pay for a gambling problem. How's how's things now? I know when we spoke last in the middle of the year, you'd spoken to him on the phone and had a like a you know, a burst into tears. I think both of you. Um, yeah. yeah. Where are things at now? How often do you speak? Is the, is the... Um, yeah, we speak every couple of weeks yeah. still. I could. Um, yeah, it's um, it's like it's sort of like um, 
nothing's happened, you know, but I guess that real test of healing will be when, you know, I see my family um, as a whole again. You know, I've had a few uncles down here and obviously talked to all my family. Um, now that hurt's been mostly put behind us. Um, but yeah, I actually got an email to the family Christmas this year, so that was nice to receive once again. <laughs> so, <laughs> what have you not been yeah. on the family Christmas list the last couple of years? <laughs> not last year, I think I missed that one. But um, <laughs> again, I was still, I was still in the the victim victim mentality. So, I, you know, I know my family see me put my hand up and and put making a real effort to put my life together now. So hopefully, I'll catch up them when I make a plan, yeah. which hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Right now, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure from you, you like the perspective of your granddad. It was more about um, the betrayal and the trust rather than the the amount of money. Like the amount of money probably didn't really matter. Um, but uh, like, uh, is, there, is there is there plans to like repay the money or? Anything yeah, like that's that been or? that's been um, that's been repaid in yeah. some way. But I'm still obviously repaying other debts through um, my court fines that I pay weekly. Um, oh, how so much are they? Two hundred a week. So for how um, long? Until sixty something k gets paid back. So it's going to be for a while. <laughs> what was that for? My maths isn't that sharp. Um, for the other charge that I got on the same day. So yeah, as I said, like it's um, a test of patience, and um, I was never that good at paying my bills. So I guess. <laughs> to um, finally have my big boy pants on being able to put my money in the right direction finally um, has been another massive learning as well. Not that I have a lot of it, but um, the wheels are in motion slowly. Yeah, and what's your, um, yeah, yeah, what's your, what's your um, inner voice and in, inner critic like these days? How, um, how do you feel about yourself when you're alone? Uh, a lot better than I did a year ago today, Dom, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it still doesn't disappear, um, that voice, that inner critic. So I do, you know, I do battle from time to time. It's not all rainbows and sunshines in recovery land. There are times, you know, when I lie in bed and I can't shut that voice down. So I do have, you know, tools that I use, exercise massive for me, uh, meditation, the container of people that um, have offered me support down here is, an, is, again, a safe space to unload that. Um so my good mate Jakey Boy, as you know, he's always uh, he's always a good one to talk to. But I think the inner critic will always be there. It's just slowly over time making peace with that and getting used to this new game of life that I'm trying to create for myself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Do you love yourself or, or even like yourself? Um, definitely. Get in there, Dom. Mm. If you asked me that question last year, I would have said hell no. But, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one because um, – you know, I've always grown up striving um, to try and be better. Um, I think I said to you last time when I was playing rugby and I got two tries, I'd be like, why don't you get three? You know, you're useless, you're shit. So <laughs> I'm slowly making peace with that um, for the height, I guess, expectations that I set myself for so long. Yeah. yeah it's a tough one, eh? It's a tough Hard one. Out. It's a tough one that I think it's a work in progress for most of us all the time. But it's like you're um, my dealings with you. You're a you're a really nice guy. Like you'd never be mean to anyone else. So it seems odd that you'd be so horrible to yourself at times. Yeah, and I guess that's that identity that I created for myself over time. You know, I guess always looking up to my dad, um, wanting to be what he was, and I guess never feeling like I really, even though you know I made some good rugby teams and you know scored some good tries over time, I never really felt like I was fulfilling that potential if you know what I mean and that's just you know the hurt kid and a critic and a child um so yeah the world's in the world's in progress but I'm definitely yeah I like myself I think I'm a good kid most of the time <laughs> it's just when you know when I dip back into the things that ruin my life you know like the alcohol gambling and drugs that would take me further away from I guess the real person that I wanted to be so becoming a bit closer and dropping from head into heart is um it's a journey, but one I'm one I'm on. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's a downward spiral sort of thing. So you do these things which give you like a like a, a a quick rush or a sugar hit or whatever you want to call it, like gambling, drugs, whatever. But then you feel even worse afterwards, and you're filled with guilt and shame and stuff. Yeah, would that be a fair way of sort of looking at it? Well, well, yeah, it's like a it's like anything, I guess. You know, after I'd been drinking, I'd be hungover. After I, you know, used to do class A drugs, I'd definitely have a come down. And, you know, after gambling, when you've sort of thrown 10K at a wall and you don't have any return for it, you know, that's um, 
you do beat yourself. I did beat myself up. It was, um, you know, that inner voice. Why do you keep doing this? Why can't you break the cycle? You know, you're shit. Um, so being able to grow more time and I guess, as I said, detaching from that identity is a massive struggle, but one that I'm getting closer towards, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you're doing great, mate. You're doing great. And, mm. uh, I, yeah, I never knew your dad, but I feel like if he was around, he'd be proud of the work you've done this year. Like Maybe even more proud of the work you've done this year than the stuff you did on the field. Yeah, thanks, brother. It's, yeah, as I said, it's yeah. Oh, this is way harder than anything that you have to do on the field, you know. Um, for me, it's quite easy to get fit and then to get into shape for rugby, but to stay on top of your mental health and addictions and then, you know, I guess putting other people's perception to the side is um, a lot harder than an 80-minute game of rugby. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned before um, uh, Jacob Skilling, who um, I, I met when I came down and did the podcast with you, and we've sort of become mates since. What's, um, tell us about him. Like, how did you meet? What's your relationship with him? He's like your best mate, right? Yeah, he's like best mate. I guess, yeah, I guess I, the only guy I had a bromance with in this adult life is his dad, and we sort of did everything together because, um, you know, we're two boys from the Hawks Bay, and, lived up the road from each other, similar age, made professional scene at the same time. And I guess, yeah, bumping into Jake in my 30s and realising, you know, that there's another brother like myself on the same journey um, of sobriety and someone that needs a mate like I do as well has been pretty special. <laughs> I mean, we're from two different walks of life. He's um, he's actually come from a harsher upbringing than I have and was dealt a pretty rough hand, um, grew up around drugs violence all that sort of shit um sexual harm etc cetera, etc cetera. and he's, he's an inspiration for where he is today you know two and a half years off drugs and alcohol um he did a seven eight year lag as well so um you know i've had a i've had a pretty good life compared to him so you know to be able to see another brother doing that too gives me inspiration and you know if there are moments where i doubt myself um he soon brings me back into line through either through the human humor or um, his crook chat. Yeah, how, <laughs> he does have very crook chat. Um, yeah, how did your paths cross, you two? Um, oh, so I reached out to a mutual friend, Rob Mukuraka, who works in, who does some awesome work in the suicide prevention space oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, Rob, for anyone that um that, that doesn't know, he was um he was he, he became quite well known. He was in the news a number of years ago for um yeah uh, attempting to take his own life by a, a way that's called suicide by cop where you basically you know, encourage or provoke the police to shoot you. And he survived yeah, that pretty shooting, much. right? Is that it? In a yeah, he survived that. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. Now he does a theatrical play, I guess, on his life, his struggles, and and where he's at tonight, today and making peace with um, that Tanifa, which is, in fact, you know, you're hurt in a child or demon or what, however you want to look at it. So, yeah, he linked um, Jacob, Jacob and I up, and then Jacob and I started working together, and then we realised that we were... Um, pretty identical in a lot of ways um so yeah we've been um sort of joined at the hip since now you know we live together moved into his house with um another another close friend and yeah we just feed up feed off each other you know there's times where he's down or i'm down and we um just there to support each other and pick each other back up but um yeah as i said he's lived a whole different life to me in terms of violence and um yeah, the type of people he's been around. So it's, you know, another learning for me that, you know, I, I wasn't dealt the roughest hand, but I, you know, no matter what hand we were dealt, we can grow from it if we want it enough. Yeah, ab absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think the one of the first times I met him, he, he picked me up from the airport. And uh, one of the first things he said is that he stabbed six people when he was in jail. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had the most harrowing ride from the, the airport to Christchurch City. And I've never seen someone on their phone so much while they drive. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I say to him every time, I'm like, I lost my license because of this, bro. It's going to happen to you too. Um, yeah, yeah. But no, it's a, yeah, he's he's out the gate. But he's um, a lovely he's guy and, though. Yeah, great lovely guy. Lovely guy. Yeah. His heart's in the right space. He's helping a he's helping a lot of people. And um, yeah, we sort of just bounce off each other. Both as crazy each other, but both staying on this journey of um, trying to be better versions of self whilst helping others within the community if we can as well. Yeah, I love it. And you, and you can you can see you guys when you're together. You both feed off each other quite nicely. And I can tell when uh, if one of you was like shit, let's. Let, let's get a bag and do some rails. The other, the other one would always be like, no, let's not do that. So there's always going to be someone there that's got their head in the right space. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, pretty much. Um, 
there, you know, there, 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 there are times where, you know, we've discussed it. What happened if we could do this? And so there's always that one guy that's like, no, we can't do that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although, uh, yeah. Have, have you ex- just accepted now that you, like, you just, you just can't like drink socially. You can't have a couple of beers. You can't have one beer after cricket. Have you sort of, sort of accepted that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Like went down to the pub up the road after cricket here on Saturday and, um, yeah, well, the boys having a beer or vodka or whatever they drink, and I just grab a water. And um, this is probably the longest time that I haven't drunk before since the age of about 13. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm quite proud of myself, but also, yeah, it just it has become normal for me, um, although I haven't put myself in too many social settings yet, um, which I guess will be another test. I just know that yeah, my identity has changed a lot to the guy that I used to be, I guess, chasing exterior bullshit that I'm just over now. Yeah. What about um, yeah. any sort of like physical changes or um, or mind changes that you notice from um, being sober? Like any pleasant surprises like sleeping better or, you know, uh, your skin looking better or anything like that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I lost I, from the start of my sentence in March. I got up to about 107 kgs and then... I got down to 93 at one stage. I don't think I'm at 93 anymore. I might be up in the mid to high 90s, but um, definitely a lot healthier in terms of not being hungover all the time, but I'm a bit of a binger on the chocolate and lollies anyway, so that is sort of <laughs> the substitute at times. But um, definitely a lot more mental clarity, not as fucked on a Sunday. You know, I'm not lying in bed or worrying over mistakes that I've made and stuff. So, yeah, I guess day by day that piece is sort of is creeping in, but it, oh, I couldn't imagine... I guess, um, you know, a Sunday hungover anymore. Life's hard enough as it is. So, yeah, I definitely th- know that I've made peace with that, but it's just keeping accountable and keeping consistent, Yeah, oh, which has you. proven the hardest thing for me. And yeah. what's your relationship status at the moment? Last time I came down, you were you were with a lovely uh, lovely young lady that you met on home detention. You're, you're still seeing her or you, you're single now? Um, yeah, we still, we still get along. Yeah. We're just sort of on our own path at the moment because um, – you know, I've started a business. I'm bloody player coach out at Woodin. I'm um, involved in operations with the trust, so I've got a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and she's, you know, got some things that she needs to work on her personal life for her growth as well. And on, although we still um, talk and and catch up and have a great relationship, we're sort of just um, going our own path in terms of what's best for us at the moment. Um, because I also get a, a, a very full mind at times, especially when I'm trying to do a lot. So um, at times I can be a little shut off. So there's still lots of learnings and growth there for me in terms of communication mostly and letting someone fully into my life. Yeah, yeah. And it, so how did you guys meet? Was it like uh, through an app? <laughs> you know it's through an app, Dom. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I like, I, like, I, I want to know something that we've never, never, never discussed about this because, um, I, I don't know, like, when, when you first matched and uh, then she started telling her family or friends or whatever that she's seeing Zach Gilford and he's on home detention, like, I'm guessing there was some blowback or some backlash from her family or friends. Like, uh, did she have to? Did she? Did she discuss that with you? Did she have to deal with that? Because, yeah, harder, yeah, but uh, I guess because she's from a different life than I'm from and um, a, quite a sheltered life, she didn't tell her family for, I think, maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months, yeah. some of them. So for me, again, there was, you know, there were like those thoughts in my head, you know, but, all, but I also realised that, you know, I'm not the victim anymore and that, you know, was, so I had to accept that that was part of her journey yeah. in terms of telling her family because most people in society would judge. You know, someone being on a home D bracelet. I remember I used to walk around and I used to, if I seen someone on something's ankle, I used to be the one that would steal or look and think, what have they done? So um, naturally, yeah, she didn't tell her parents and um, family members for a while because of, I guess, fear of being judged. Um, but when she did, you know, it was just, yeah, I just explained my, I guess, my story and um, I'm pretty open and transparent about yeah. where I'm at now. So that sort of, I guess, help with um acceptance from them yeah yeah that, God, that, that stigma's got to be hard though eh? it's got to be, yeah it's it is gotta, hard it's, like, do, do you I, get sort of anxiety like when you when you meet someone new about oh, how they how they're going to perceive me like, yeah i mean we were we went to um myself and a couple of friends went to an all you can eat last night because um 
I guess just to celebrate being off home, D. Not that we really need and all you can eat, but just when I was there, you know, I, there were a lot of people there, and I just, um, I guess, part of my growth too. I, you know, I, I didn't feel totally comfortable there because of, you know, the thoughts. What do people think of me? Do they recognise me? Blah blah blah. Um, so yeah, there's definitely a lot of that social anxiety, but I'm hoping um, once you know, get further along, then um, a part of that guilt and shame will also drop as well. Because um, there are times where I thought, you know, no, I'm on top of this. But when you find yourself, I guess, looking at the ground, because you don't want people to look you in the eye when you're out for dinner, you know that there's a fair way to go. You, you do, so I'm, I'm guessing um, whenever people come up to you, it's always nice. Like no one's ever going to come up to you and say anything, uh, you know, nasty to your face. But can you sort of sense where groups of people are like whispering or perhaps talking about you? Um. I try not to because yeah. that'd be a bit of paranoia creeping in. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but you, can, of, you know what I mean. You can sort of vibe it. I, I think when yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you, you can tell when people look at you, when you recognise and stuff. And if some people come up and say say hi, then I'm you know more than happy to talk to them and stuff. But as I said, well, you know, as you said, you don't really get people come up and um, write the messages that they would on a on a Facebook um, thread or something like that. You know, 100%. because. Yeah, because people are keyboard warriors and they won't come up and say that to your face. Um, well, very seldom anyway. And if they did, I'd, you know, I'd quite happily take it on the chin and appreciate their feedback whilst trying to keep a cool head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you say? Say, say you're, say you're at the, um, the, the, the buffet last night. You know, getting as much um, pork on your plate as you can, and someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, you're a, you know, you're a, yeah, a leopard can't change their spots. You know, you're no good, and you're never going to be anything." Like, how, how would you react to that if someone said that to your face? Um, I'd have to drop a lot of my ego and I guess pride at the time and switch from, um, you know, that victim mindset to owning my stuff and, and just say, look, I have made a lot, a lot of mistakes over time. Um, but again, that doesn't really happen in real life. It only happens over the computer yeah, or Facebook yeah. or, you know, where people try and have a go and then they finally block you because they don't want to tell it to your face in real person. Um, it is frustrating, but again, that's um, work that I've got to do to, you know, drop my ego and, and make peace of where I'm at and drop a lot of that guilt and shame. But I think I'm a, you know, a long way on that journey. So I just need to keep stepping forward one foot in front of the other because it is, it is fucking hard, especially because I know that I did have an ego over time and I did think I was pretty cool. Um, yeah, so again, it's all part of that removal, removal, removal of the false identities that I've attached over time. Yeah, I, I had um, you know, Dr. Paul Wood, eh? Yeah, Jack knows a bit, of, a lot more better right. story than I do, but um, yeah. yeah. So I had uh, Dr. Paul Wood on the podcast a few weeks ago. He um, he's uh, um, he's got a few degrees now. He's written a couple of books. He's a motivational speaker. Um, but when he was eighteen, he murdered his drug dealer and spent his entire twenties in jail. Um. And he talked to me about just how hard it is to get like redemption in New Zealand and how people just want to put you in this box and not let you move on. Um, yeah, hopefully that's not going to be the same experience. I mean, what you've done is very different to what he's done. Um, mm. But yeah, hopefully people can allow you to prove yourself and, um, you know, reset and move forward. Yeah, I hope so. You know, there's, I guess in the social settings that I've been in at the moment, which have only been a few, um, you know, people have been nice, but... Yeah, it is a hard place to recover because we do set such high standards, not only for ourselves, but also for especially people that make it in the public arena, whether they be sportsmen or whoever the hell they are. Um, we expect them to stay at that level of excellence until they pretty much die, you know. But we know that's impossible um, because we're imperfect humans. So, yeah, the game of life is pretty tough in this country, especially when you're trying to... Um, come back from, I guess, rock bottom, suicidal thoughts or the path I carved for myself over time. So trying to create that new one is one where you have to stay completely, I guess, centred, but also be a bit selfish in terms of in terms of putting myself out there again to the public and stuff like that. Even when you asked, I was like, oh, shit, I don't know if I'm ready to do another podcast. But Oh, really about, great- this, about this one today? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but you're a great man yourself. So I guess, um, yeah, I mean, the first podcast I did with you, when people ask about the gambling, they're like, how do you do it? And I'm like, the only way to get over a gambling addiction is to is to talk, but also to 
talk to those people that are close to you because secrets make you sick and that's all gambling is it's one big secret so the best thing that i did was to do that first podcast view because it held me accountable to a wider group and a wider network and it sort of it definitely got my i guess momentum up in terms of that accountability yeah I'm, I'm so pleased you did and you were you were so um yeah, for anyone that didn't hear that podcast it was like maybe back in june or july and you were so honest and you, you talked about a lot of stuff like um selling your world cup medal for a couple of grand and having twenty five thousand dollar bets on horse races and stuff like that <laughs> and i remember you, me- you messaged me afterwards the week the week or so after it came out and uh it was a real nice message you said um i think it was like your mum or some other people had messaged you saying they heard it and it gave them a new sort of appreciation or understanding about how you ticked yeah, Which is really and cool. I, yeah, and I'm still getting to learn, I guess, how I actually tick myself as well. Um, you know, for so long, that identity of a, of a rugby player, my life was sort of created for me. All I had to do was put on my boots, run out there, train and, and play rugby. But apart from that, you know, my days were put together. Um, a lot of our food plans were put together. Um, so being able to, I guess, yeah, as I said, carve this new path for myself that doesn't have a lot of rugby attached to it has been um, yeah, pretty challenging, but one one that's worth it because I get to do it for myself and it's not, you know, done by other people. So it's um, a lot of hard work. But yeah. So you're involved. Um, you're involved now in a, in a trust called the uh, the Broken Movement Trust with um, Jacob Skilling, who we mentioned before. What's the um, what's the gist of that trust for anyone that doesn't know about it? Um, so the gist of it is really just to help people who I guess have suffered or are, or are suffering um, from mental health addiction um, whatever it might look like uh, I guess our, our passion f- from it is driven from our own experiences so obviously Jake's been in a long lag in prison having to turn his life around and me living in an addiction for so long and um, making the ch- choice to to change mine so we're trying to get a few programs up and going into 2023 which um, which help people learn tools that we need in this day and age to, I guess, survive away from uh, tools that we've used in the past that no longer serve us, like violence, like addiction, um, sex, whatever it might be. So we run these programs in the wider upper when I was involved in suicide prevention. So um, we have got the wheels moving and hopefully we will get a few of those underway early into 2023 to help our, our men who women and um, children who do struggle with trauma, whether that be historical or present. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's a definite mental health crisis at the moment, isn't it? And I, and I, I think it's only going to get worse in the next couple of years as um, you know, the economy sort of turns to shit a little bit more. So it's good that you guys are, good you guys are doing that and are offering this platform. Yeah, hard. Cool. well, um, a big thing we talked about is, you know, you used to be able to go to the neighbour, everyone knew their neighbour and you used to be able to go to their neighbour if you needed a cup of flour, a cup of sugar, and I think a big thing that's been removed from part of our life are the community events and the wholesomeness that we used to have within our communities. And I don't know whether it's um, technology or, you know, we just get so caught up in our own little world that it's either, that it's only our screen or what's in front of us that matters that, you know, we don't have the community events anymore. That's how we got to know who was in our community and who we could trust and what we could do. But I just think, you know, there's so many short-term pleasures that we can enjoy now, whether that be alcohol, drugs, Uber Eats, we can pretty much get everything on our doorstep. So um, we're going to endeavour to recreate that That community stuff. So, yeah, yeah, that connection to to self, but also to a wider network. Yeah, I think think a lot of us realised during uh, the, the various lockdowns over the last couple of years just how important that is and how much you miss it when it's not there, eh? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, you know. You can't even, well, I mean, you used to walk past someone or run past someone and say g'day to everyone you, you ran past, but now, so, you know, we're either looking at our phones or looking at the ground because we don't want to look the other person in the eye and it's just, yeah, total loss of connection mm. over the years. Yeah, and how's, um, I, I've seen on your Instagram stories, you um, you go to church a lot of the weekends now. What's um, What role is faith playing in your life? What, 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 were you religious before before you hit rock bottom or is this a... Yeah. Yep. I grew up um, always believing in God, so every time I sort of read out for a game or, or, you know, every time before I go to bed, I'd say a prayer. I grew up in um, sort of a, a Catholic upbringing. Um, so it's a little bit different to the church I go to down here, which is more Christian faith. Um, and again, it's just, you know, I wouldn't say um, I'm a Bible basher or I force it on anyone, but it's just, for me, it's just another safe space where I can grow and I guess let my guard down 
and um, find some peace, really. Um, yeah. Yeah, do you think it's going to continue being part of your life? Yeah, definitely. Yeah yeah. yeah, 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 I think so. You know, I've met some really good people through the church. Um, and as I said, you know, it's a space for me where I can go on Sunday and, and totally switch off and I guess um, wash away what's happened during the week and, and start fresh for the upcoming week. Um, we didn't actually go last night, so we'll probably get a slap on the hand today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it sounds like you and I had similar um, similar upbringings in the fact that we're we're both um, Catholic. Do you, do you do you suffer that Catholic guilt where you do something bad and you just beat yourself up more than most people? Yeah, harder. <laughs> <laughs> It's an actual fuck. It's an actual thing. Eh? That's why we've got to run like ten or twenty k to get over it. Oh god, <laughs> tell me about it. And and what about what about work? You mentioned something before about being in business. Now, what are you what are you doing? Yeah, so um, started a few other uh, started a little company with a few others called GSS Employment Group. Um, so we help people get into work. Pretty much, we help I guess fill gaps that our clients um, are struggling to fill. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty rewarding job. We started in sort of the middle of October and now we have sort of 40 to 50 staff under us. So um, it's challenging, but it's, um, I love it. You know, you get to help people get into work and then talk to them on the daily, talk to clients, talk to all different walks of life and we get some interesting people through our doors. So I guess, you know, being able to see people from, you know, um, brokenness into getting employment and creating to earn for their family to put um, bread and butter on the table, which is it's pretty expensive these days. This is, um, is pretty rewarding. Yeah. And what about you financially from this? Are you doing okay now? No, nah, hell no. I'm still broke as, but um, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be, um, yeah, again, a, another test of patience to, I guess, get out of debt and get back into, I guess, some financial freedom again. But, you know, we're still looking at a fair way to go yet. Um, oh, with the court fines and things. Yeah, court fines and your know, other debt. I probably got it myself into about three hundred and fifty k of debt over time. So just you know, really um, on what? Eh? How? <laughs> Gambling. I told oh. you. I'd... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like you know, shit, just, how sorry. shit were you? <laughs> yeah, I was pretty shit. Hey, but as I said, like it didn't. <laughs> It didn't matter whether I won a million or two million dollars. It was yeah, never going to be enough, yeah. you know, because it was never enough. You know, one bag was never enough. Two bags never enough. You know, hundred thousand was never enough. So it was just, it was just that hurt child and inner critic always wanting more or thinking he needed more. Um, when in fact, you know, now I know what the value of money is. A hundred bu- hundred bucks is uh, is quite tasty these days. So it can get me a long way. But in the past, you know, that just used to go down the drain because I was always chasing more than. A, yeah, I thought so, I needed. So, so I'm guessing, um, say five to ten years ago, success for you would have looked like, um, yeah, being an All Black, being a successful All Black, scoring tries, and making a shit ton of money overseas. How would you define like success for Zach Guilford now, moving forward? Um, success for me, getting out of bed, <laughs> making my bed, going for a run, and attacking the day and helping people. It, um, yeah, if I can help myself first, and then. I, you know, I have got a big heart and I love helping other people. So being able to do that, whether that's in the employment game, um, in the community with the Broken Movement Trust or still on the field with the rugby boys, um, I've got some pretty big, well, some pretty good platforms that I can leverage off and, and help within the community. So success does look a, a lot different. Um, used to look like a hat trick or, you know, going out there and playing the game I love to, I guess, um, fulfill what was my passion at the time and these days i have you know other avenues to give back which is which is also which is also really rewarding and it's just keeping that perspective you know and not trying to get too far ahead of myself yeah it's good for the soul i guess eh? i mean it looks very different but it's also probably more rewarding in a lot of ways yeah it is it is more rewarding like i think yeah a lot of that um enjoyment used to get from professional rugby a lot of that pleasure come from the headlines, if you know what I mean. Seeing yeah. my name in the paper um, for doing well, and that's all all ego driven stuff. Um, I already knew I was good at rugby. You don't need to read the paper to to um, to you know. I, guess, I was yeah. always the one on stuff trying to get that validated. Seeing how close I was to making the rugby World Cup team and listening to reading all the comments and stuff. And I guess just being able to switch off from that and focus, you know, what's actually what actually is in front of me and what actually is important. 
is um is pretty cool yeah now i had um sir john kerwin on the uh, the podcast um a few months ago and uh it, we after we finished recording we were talking about you and he because this was after i spoke to you and he was asking some questions about you and he said to me something like um the hard thing for zach will be getting over his own guilt and shame moving forward yeah uh, how, how do you feel about that uh that was probably the hardest thing hence why you know I always hid behind the alcohol and drug for so long and didn't and not until i hit my actual rock bottom that i really came clean about the gambling because i had to um so that was a lot of the guilt and shame you know i never ever wanted anyone to know that i was the poor all black who was trying to chase his ass gambling to sort of get by and that's why the cycle continued for 10 plus years you know it was because i didn't want anyone to know because i was hiding beneath that guilt and shame um but i'm definitely not there yet you know as i said going out for dinner and hanging my head down because i don't want anyone to um to recognize me um tells me i've got heaps more work to do but i know i'm a long way from where i was you know, this time last year or when we last spoke, Dom. So it's, um, yeah, it is yeah. a big part and probably the biggest part. Oh, good on you. And I know it's like a day-by-day -day thing, but dream scenario five years from now, how's your life looking? Um, How old are you now? What are you? 33. 33. See, on, yeah. the, on the on the big scheme of things, you're still you're still young, eh? I, I'm forty yeah. I'm forty nine, and uh, so I'm I'm old. But I I, <laughs> I I say to people, I still consider myself young in a lot of ways. It's like if I get to live to eighty, it means I've still got thirty odd years left. So I'm I'm just getting started. So if you think, yeah, exactly. think of it, if you think of it like a, if your lifespan like a sports game, you're still you're still like in the first half. Yeah, and that's what I got to keep reminding myself um, because going through my twenties, you know, I'm like always remember thinking, fuck, I've dug a big hole here. I'm not going to be able to get out of it. The only way I'm going to be able to get out of it is by gambling more or just, you know, by getting out of it with a big win. And that that was sort of how I viewed myself my whole way through my 20s. And then when I come to my 30s, I didn't have another contract to pick up because I'd fucked everything up. So I guess being able to keep that big-term picture alive and not getting caught up in the moment um, with impatience will be massive for me because, as you said, I still – have a long way to go. I'm only in the first yeah. half. Oh, the mate. first, the first. Well, probably a bit out of the first third now. I don't know if I'm going to live to 100. <laughs> Ten minutes left in the first half. <laughs> yeah, so it's just keeping that big picture goal. But for me, it, it still, if I'm still, I, it's one day at a time. But I'd still like to be to be sober and staying away from the things that have brought down my life because I know if I can do that, then that's um, I, I will be pretty successful in some way i don't know what that'll look like but i think hopefully with peace um uh, that's how i'll be successful yeah yeah are you seeing are you seeing a therapist or anyone um not at the moment no you have done um, that yeah yeah i have done um but yeah as i said you know probation uh didn't have the capabilities to help me see a therapist i'm obviously chipping away at a fair bit of um personal stuff to help get a little bit of financial freedom again one day so um yeah, I can't afford it at the moment, yeah. pretty much. But um, well, that, that's, so yeah, I, I was seen a, I was seen a, um, a therapist for my gambling, but I've sort of clocked that program for now. So um, yeah, that finished about three or four weeks ago. Yeah, that's a hard thing about therapy. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that could get a lot of good out of it, but um, the cost can be quite prohibitive for a lot of people. Yeah, and it's about finding the right one as well. Like yeah. for me. I didn't really find the right person who I could open up to, uh, who I could open up to until earlier this, or till about March, April this year, and that was sort of 13, 14 years of trying to mm. find a therapist that I could connect with, and it wasn't until I found out that I had ADHD and that I could actually connect with this particular person who had diagnosed me of ADHD that, you know, I thought, shit, you know, there's some real benefits here of therapy. Mm. Has, has it helped? So you got the um, ADHD diagnosis earlier this year, around about the same time as you um, quit all your vices. Um, how, how has have, have you learned to sort of coexist with it, or what have you learned about yourself with ADHD and how it makes you operate? Um, it brought a lot of acceptance um, finding out I had ADHD because for so long. But I didn't even think of myself as the ADHD guy because I wasn't that hyperactive guy as such. A lot of the time I could be, but I didn't see myself as that guy. Yeah. If you know what I mean? I was the more inattentive, just playing a hundred million stories over and over in my head. Um, but it definitely made me accept who I was because for so long I just thought I was a cunt and I was like, just beat myself up with that inner critic, you know? I'm like, why do I do this? Why do I do why am I so impulsive? Why do I have this anger? What but 
when I found out I had ADHD, it made me make peace with a lot of that. And when I or if I act in a particular way now, I can sort of, I know where it's coming from. Yeah, yeah. Are you on, yeah. Me, are you on meds? Are you on Concerta or Ritalin or anything? Yeah, I'm on the Concerta. Um, so 36 megs a day of that. But um, yeah, I sort of change between 80 and 36 megs just depending on how I'm feeling that day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. It seems like you're in a really good place. Yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of work to be done, but I know there's a lot of work that's been done also. So as I said, it's a simple formula that I can make easy or hard for myself. It's just to stay away from the things that have brought me to my knees during my life, and that's gambling, alcohol, and drugs. Um, and if I can stay away from those along with, you know, helping people in the community, then I'm fulfilling my purpose. But, yeah. Yeah, good on you. Oh, you, you mentioned before, like, the, your financial black hole. Who, like, who do you, who do you owe the 250, 300,000 or whatever? Who do you owe that to? Yeah. Uh, who do I not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't owe me anything. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I'm joking. No, I guess, I'll edit um, that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, just financial institutions over time, you know, friends, family. Um, yeah, as I said, it was 10 years of just thinking that I could work myself out of a rabbit hole that I never could. So um, to slowly be doing that now inch by inch, is again a massive test of patience but i know there's just no other way yeah Shit, that's a stressful way to live your life yeah it sucked and it did suck for a long time but it's slowly getting easier yeah yeah you you seem like you're um you seem right now like it's just i know we're in different locations and i'm just looking at you on my screen but um you seem you, you seem peaceful it seems like you got a like yeah a fair, fair, fair amount of inner peace at the moment yeah a fair amount of inner peace and i guess just also Having some perspective on life and knowing where I'm hopefully going for for a better way of putting it, if you know what I mean. So I've just made peace that I can't control what's going to happen in the future. I can't control what's happened in the past. All I can do is live in the now and try and put one foot in front of the other. And um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a, it's a complete bore to the life that I used to live. But I know that there's no finding peace down the up, down the rabbit hole that I was down previously. So, um, yeah, this is it for now, and it's all good. Yeah, so I, I love that um, that motto, and you've said it a couple of times uh, about put, putting one foot in front of the other. It's like a, a running metaphor as well. It's like when things get dark in a running race, you just you know, keep doing that, and you know, eventually you'll make it to the finish line. Um, yeah, it, it is it is a good one. I think. Uh, like it could be daunting to you, for you to think about like the next 40, 50, 60 years without any, <laughs> I don't know, an inverted commas fun. Um, but yeah. it's like if you just take it day by day, that's probably the only way to take it, right? Yeah, well, that was what I considered fun in my life for so long. So, yeah, I'm not going to... Um... I'm not going to paint it like it's like it's easy to do. Pretty much flip your life on the head and change the whole script. Um, but it's something well worth doing, if you know what I mean, because no one deserves to live in, in pain, whether it be in their own head or for something they're put through. So to be able to flip the script and and change and rewrite rewrite the narrative is, is something pretty powerful. And I respect anyone anyone that um, that is doing that currently or has done it. Yeah, no, oh, good for you. you. You seem really in touch with who you are as a person now. Are you, are you quite emotional these days? Like, when was the last time you cried? Can you remember? Um, what is it? I, I cried on my dad's birthday, which was uh, twelve days ago. So you know, I sat on the toilet in the morning, and then tears started coming out. And that never, I never used to cry. If you know what I mean. Um, and I don't try and cry these days, but you know, if it, I guess, be more in touch and removing a few identities and masks, it, it does allow those emotions to flow a little bit more. Um, I would like to cry more at times, but <laughs> I guess it's all part of the journey and um, and moving forward. But, yeah, the tears definitely do come a little bit more now, which is, I guess, is, is pleasing because I can feel again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you've got those emotions and um, you can experience them and all, their, and all their messiness and whatever. <laughs> Um, oh, that's that's really sad about your dad. Yeah, I I don't think. Um, I mean, I'm oh god, I'm not a psychologist or anything, but I don't think you can underestimate the um, you know, the role his death at such a young age and also how it happened has has played in the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah, I guess 
yeah, that was it was hectic, you know, lining up for a medal and then five minutes later seeing your dad dead in the stands, I'm, it was like shit. And I sort of made that decision subconsciously and sort of consciously, you know, when he passed away, I got I got angry and mad at the world. So I thought, you know, dad's the only one that can tell me what to do. Now he's now he's not around. No cunt's going to tell me what to do. And excuse my French, I knew I, should, I shouldn't use that word, but that's how I felt at the time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And being able to recognise that now is pretty pleasing as well because it shows that there's some growth and um, I am recognising what's gone before me and, and the role that it played because yeah. it helps me make make peace with it I guess to, yeah. to put it in a nutshell yeah that's really cool now, if he was if he was sitting with you now what do you think he'd say about about who you are today um you'd probably give me a pretty strong slap across the ears at first but uh, <laughs> I think you know also just to keep going um keep continuing on this path that I'm on and keep striving to leave the bullshit behind um he was a man of i guess not many words but he, he put it straight up and honestly and i think that's how he would tell me today wouldn't um i guess put any fury rapping or, or cotton coated at all it'd just be you know to keep pressing on with the journey i'm today and um to keep my head up yeah i reckon i'd be proud of where you are today yeah, thank you, brother. Yeah, and 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 last question: What would your what would your message be to anyone that's um, maybe like listening to this or watching this right now at their own uh, version of rock bottom? Like uh, maybe it's with addiction or gambling or whatever it happens to happens to be. What would your message be to those people? It'd be keep searching for the light because there are times where I couldn't see a lot of light and I just I felt like giving up. And the one time that I did give up and I decided to, you know, that I don't want to live anymore, my life to be over, and I tried to commit suicide. When I did come back to consciousness and around from that, I realized that I didn't want to die. I just wanted the pain to stop. Um, so definitely keep searching for that light. It is possible to rewrite the narrative, even if you have to do it by yourself. Um, we all have a lot more strength that, than we think we have at times. And if you can keep searching for that light and keep putting one foot in front of another, the narrative will change and you will create a story that is better than the bullshit you've lived in in the past. It won't happen overnight. It might not even happen within a year, but it will happen. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's probably a good place to end it. Really good to catch up, man. I really appreciate your time. Um, <laughs> thanks for being so open and transparent with your journey. Um, I'm pleased you're in a good place now. And yeah, it's something you've said a few times during this hour, you know, about putting one foot in front of the other, and I think it's a good motto. And uh, yeah, mate, I just wish you a very Merry Christmas, Happy 2023, and um, onwards and upwards, eh? Yeah, appreciate it, Tom. You're a good man, and um, appreciate you, brother. So thank you. Yeah, love your work, mate. Talk soon. Cheers, brother. See you, thank Zay. you. Please, love.